jumping talk about peaceful and again I don't know if it's going to try to attack me or not I don't know if they're nesting over there but look at it it's almost like it wanted to be on camera thank you there swan beautiful It's almost like we're checking each other out. What up, dude? You got some shit hanging off your beak. Oh, that was pretty cool. this alpine meadow it's uh well there's lazy mountain piner peak is obscured by the rainfall over here hold on i'll get out and uh take a little walk around here since we're on a little higher elevation for y'all oh, awesome, oh yeah this is there's the ocean right there yep there's the inlet cook inlet down over yonder hatcher's pass would be that direction around the corner um, look at that rainfall coming over Pioneer Peak the Knick glaciers back around that corner there's Lazy Mountain so back around the corner there would be the Knick glacier I, I recorded that last winter and then that this direction continuing on down goes to the Matanuska glacier but here's where we are this is just Look at how, how jagged the tops are up there. Just, anyway. All right, we're gonna see how much further we can get and uh, we'll be back. It's a little windy. Came back up on the 500 side by side over there. Here's where we are. We just came up from down here. As you can see, visibility is uh, good from here looking out, but like trying to see through all this stuff is kind of pointless. We're gonna check out that gully that kicks up. You can see some of the cottonwood trees sticking out of it over here. We're gonna check it out. See what, uh, see if it holds any, any secrets. We'll figure it out though. Man, I love Alaska. Here, I'll show you. I'll record going down. I've, it was too bumpy, we're holding on. I couldn't steady a camera for it, but. Got squatch bait Isaac right over here. Well, I'll, I'll just record it when we when we get back down because I gotta go back a little ways and eh. anyway. Still 
you can see the whole frame of the Honda just swaying. <laughs> Woohoo! It's a few small bumps. Yeah. Two very small bumps. Comparatively speaking. Oh, a little wet in here. Ooh. Stay in between the trenches. What? Oh, that looks like crap. Here, I'm gonna go look in that mud real quick, man. Let's not go that way because that's a headache waiting to happen. Yeah. There's a side trail right over here. I'm gonna see what kind of tracks. Oh, got some moose tracks. Looks like some holy shit wolf tracks here. Look at these bad boys. Damn. Four toed. That's pretty like good size. Mountain lion, though. Looks oh, like it could be. Here's the moose tracks going through here. Looks like it's smaller calf. I uh, see some boot tracks. Someone's little dog. Little yapper. Oh, here's some here's some bear tracks. There's a bear track there. You can see the, the claws in the ground there. Do do do. Don't stare at your feet. What's that? Yeah. <laughs> There's the other bear tracks there. You can see the claws tipped in there. We were just talking about bears. Uh, up here, you can't stare at your feet or the ground too long. Usually when I'm filming the ground for extended periods of time, I have someone standing guard. What'd you find? There's no, there's no claws at all. Right there. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. There's zero claw that I can see. Yeah, but there's no corresponding tracks to go with it. You know what I mean? Uh, probably a bear. There's one here too that doesn't have any claws. So it's probably just a young bear with teeny tiny Well, claws. this big paw print has claws. Come check this out. There's a lot of tracks here. <clears throat> yeah, this big paw, you can see it has oh, yeah. nail marks. All right. Well, the search in the wilds of Alaska continue. It's a dog man. Oh, is it, is it a dog man? Okay. You never know. But yeah, that's over our heads. Uh, found some trees down in the way of one trail. Looks like someone came to check it out before us. One step behind. Oh, look at this muck hole. It wouldn't be horrible though. It doesn't look like it's too deep. I'm not trying to wrestle that thing up this crap though. Someone's tire peel out there. High centered on this rock. Dude, this is a this is a death trap for wheelers. Yeah. It's terrible. And you wouldn't have thought that either. No. That brush. Maybe that's why people drop trees. Holy shit, it just gets worse and worse. Yeah, absolutely. Alright. Another roadblock. Here's where we're going downhill. That's looking out and then here's the trail there. And we'll see how fun this is. I'll, uh, I'll try to keep the camera steady and let you see the, the sway and rock of the, the Honda. That would be approximate level.
So we're, we're at the top of the hill. We just came bombing up. Thanks to Squatch Bait Isaac for operating the camera for us. But again, Pioneer Peak is kind of obscured. There's the butte, uh, the inlet. But someone had the right idea here, making their campsite up here on this upper alpine meadow. But as you can see, the trail continues this way. We're gonna go up it in here in just a few. But uh, yeah, it's uh, still got snow up in the ravine up there beautiful area it uh it was a bit of some steep driving there for a couple times anyway we'll get back thanks for joining me um the opening footage oh uh i'm not trying to have the candles for effect the high winds and stuff that you saw a little sample of earlier up on the hillside we were up above uh buffalo mine road taking some of those trails on up to those upper alpine valley or alpine meadows beautiful beautiful place um temporary loss of power hopefully it comes back on soon I'm not trying to have the candles for some eerie effect. Uh, no, I'm not into those theatrics. It's merely necessity. Uh, what I wanted to share with you, um, this guy, his name is, we'll, we'll call him Charlie, okay? Well, Charlie is a skilled traditional log home builder. Uh, he's from the lower 48, and he had did some pretty uh, pretty amazing uh, Canadian log jobs down, um, geez, Minnesota. I, I mean, he, it goes on and on. He, he He's very experienced. Well, he was hired on um, to this client who had 10 acres on a private lake, we'll say in, in BFA you know, uh, way out in Alaska. Well, all the logs to be used were on site. They had been cut up over the course of the last five years. And it was his job, Charlie's job, to go in with his apprentice and skin the logs, trim them up to the length he needed, and build his log cabin. So, this was approximately four years ago. It was the year before the COVID crap. And he got the contract. The first two trips in, uh, he was basically working by himself because the apprentice uh, was either having cold feet and didn't want to work or he truly wasn't feeling good. And so Charlie chalked it up to he's truly not feeling good because he, he didn't look too good. So he's basically, first two trips, he's peeling logs. He's cutting them up to length. He's starting some of the preliminary cuts that he needs to fit the logs together and stuff, you know, like Lincoln logs or whatever. And this structure is going to be two-story. And it's going to have some dormers and some porches and stuff. It's, it's going to be really nice. So that was the first couple trips, just getting a whole lot of stuff done. And he was staying in, a, he was there for a week, and then he would fly out for a week and be in civilization for you know for a week and then go back for a week so <laughs> as this was going on it was his third trip in and his apprentice uh because he kept the same one he just he gave the kid the benefit of the doubt to continue working so well it sounds like the heater came on i hope the lights kick on 
Anyway, so gives the kid the benefit of the doubt. And as their third trip in, um, he was having the kid go over to the pile of logs and bring ones because he was he was numbering the ends of them or painting them a color. Uh, the numbered ones he was using for one thing, the colored ones were used for another thing. It was interior, exterior, what have you. So he had a system laid out. Uh, in the interim, he also built up out of uh, treated lumber the floor for this cabin. Uh, there was no foundation per se. It was up on pilings and that's that's just what it was the only materials brought in were for the the floor and the subfloor and uh for some of the materials for the wrap around deck well anyway <laughs> so he's running the apprentice to to drag this number log or whatever and and get it back over and these logs are they're not overly huge you know what i mean um he had a rope system to where the kid could, you know, drag the log behind him on the ropes. And, you know, they're about 20 foot long, 15 to 20 foot. So as the kid's doing that, Charlie keeps getting his attention drawn. Now, on this lake, it's basically almond shaped. But the end where they're building the cabin kind of had a little bit of a pinnacle going out. A little bit of a, a peninsula kind of going out. And that kind of marked where the lagoon started. So if you're looking off the front porch of this cabin you had a small dock where the plane could dock and it, straight across it was about the narrowest part of the lake and then to the left would be this lagoon that was kind of kind of horseshoe shaped he said at the at the end of the one lake so he as he's working his attention keeps getting drawn straight back across the lake straight like off the front porch looking straight across and at that point he said it was about eh, roughly a hundred hundred and twenty five yards straight across and then at the the peak of the little peninsula that stuck out there it would be roughly you know 80 yards across or whatever because it was just a little bit of a peninsula there it was just the way it was set up was just nice for the cut uh the cabin layout so off the front you'd see the dock off a side door they had a swing that was to hang and swing from the upper floor and it was basically a bench seat out of a log you know really well secured and that would face back towards the lagoon because in the years past that this guy's owned the property uh when the the migrating waterfowl would come in they would kind of congregate in that area just just beautiful well, he's, his attention is constantly drawn. He can't really concentrate a whole lot, and he just couldn't figure out why. So towards the end of the, about the fourth or fifth day on the third trip, um, he, he still had a couple hours of work left, but he, he was feeling a little run down. And the apprentice of his comes back and just pale white. Now, the logs were away because the tree line started a little bit away from the cabin so all the trees were harvested on site and where they were dropped they were drug over to one place by totally different people and that's where he was peeling them and getting them graded for what he was doing and as he would do one he would have you know the piles of them set up <laughs> so the apprentice comes back to him pale white and says hey there's a bear looking at me from the back side of the log piles. Well, they hadn't seen any bears. The owner had seen plenty of bears in the years he's owned the property. Uh, they they were there, they had a 12 gauge shotgun. Uh, Charlie immediately uh, complacent, he admits he was fully complacent. He had to hunt and find where the shotgun was set because over these trips, it's just, it stayed in its zipped up case. Um, he dug it out. He made sure it was loaded. Um, gave the kid a little refresher course on how it operates in case he was incapacitated at some time and the kid needed to use it for this bear. And so he followed the kid back. The kid was very, very nervous. He let Charlie lead the way because Charlie had the shotgun. 
And now to get to these pile of logs, it's roughly 200 yards away. So as they going around, it, it's off to the left-hand side of the lagoon area and, you know, back behind the cabin ways. So they followed the trail. And once they got back over there, it was dead quiet. Uh, there was no wind. It, it was just super eerie. Charlie said as he was surveying around, he, he wasn't noticing anything out of the ordinary. So he decides to go to the back side of this log pile and look around for any bear sign, right? So he's talking to the kid. He's telling him, hey, you know, I appreciate you immediately getting my attention, not panicking. Uh, I, you didn't run back. You didn't trigger any chase response. So let's just see if we can run this bear off. Uh, the first round he had in the chamber was one of these... Uh, bear bombs it just looks like a little bomb and it's designed just to impact the bear but not penetrate the skin but just give it kind of a sting to scare it away so he has one of those in and he goes around to the backside where the kid said he saw the bear standing up behind and it was the tallest pile and this tall pile of logs was about six seven foot tall so he goes around the backside and he's like, man, it's, it's, it had to be a big bear if it was looking over the back of this pile at the kid. So he gets around back and he sees some, you know, the dirt's all, you know, kind of messed up and stuff, but nothing, no definitive tracks whatsoever. So he was just kind of, there was also a lot of bark from all these logs all over the ground. And so it just, it, you know, it blocked any real good uh, footprints. So he just kind of looks around, doesn't see anything, doesn't hear anything, and tells the kid, okay, well, uh, it's it's close to the end of the day. We'll knock off early as far as the last three logs I wanted you to drag. We'll just start a little earlier. We'll get it knocked out. So they walk back together, back to the little foundation that they had for this cabin and stuff. And uh, they were sitting there, and they had a wall tent, a canvas tent set up it had a little little wood stove in it and stuff uh just canvas you know uh, i i think he said it was 10 by 14 something like that just a nice dry place for them to you know stay warm at night with the wood stove they could dry clothes and cook they also had a coleman stove and so uh the kid was super nervous asking him all he knew about bears tell me about bears do they what do they look like when they stand up? Just weird, weird questions. Like he didn't, he didn't believe it was a bear that he saw. And, and Charlie picked up on that immediately and was like, well, what did you really see? And he goes, well, the way it was looking at me, it almost looked like a man's face. And then it ducked down. But I don't, I don't know bears that well. So I don't know if it was looking at me straight on, if it may look like a man in some weird way. And Charlie stops and he goes, a man? bear and a man don't look the same in the face you got bears have ears did this thing have ears and he goes no it didn't have ears it had kind of a rounded head and he goes well, what did you see he goes well i saw a rounded head face like a man and some shoulders and that was it and and charlie hearing that was like that's not a bear you're, you're what you're just and he kind of giggles and says <laughs> You're just you're describing a Sasquatch. What what do you what did you see? Well, the kid tells him again, goes over it. Um, he said because the way the sunlight was, he couldn't get clear image of the face. He just it was mainly silhouetted, but he saw the glint of life in the eye. <laughs> so he goes, okay. Well, we'll eat. We'll take it easy. You know, just keep get it out of your mind. It'll be okay. And so, you know, they, they just went with that. They ate, and just as they were starting to doze off for the night, a long, and now, now Charlie said it was a very, very long, bellowing, like, howling kind of growl scream. Just, he said it seemed like it lasted forever, but it was, it was very, very loud, uh, he said he felt he was laying on his cot at the time. He felt it reverberate through the cot. And the kid uh, was immediately standing up, shaking. Um, 
yeah, I get, I can imagine a very vulnerable feeling. Um, give me a second here. This battery's about to die. I'm gonna swap them out, and we'll continue. So, the kid is standing up, freaking out, and Charlie's still laying down, and he's trying to absorb what they just heard. Long, very, very drawn out. And so, he sits up, he tells the kid to sit down, calm down. The kid's like getting dressed, like he, he wants to be fully clothed. Uh, they felt very vulnerable, uh, freaked out. And meanwhile, Charlie's trying to maintain some kind of leadership because he was scared shitless. And I'm not trying to laugh. He, he laughed when he was explaining it. So the kid gets dressed. Uh, he couldn't dissuade him to keep him calm. The kid's like, I'm, I'm getting dressed and, you know, I'm, I got to be ready to run, fight, do whatever. Because that's not natural. That's not normal. And, you know... Charlie was trying to ease his mind by saying, well, we don't know that it's not normal. We, we're, you know, we're not here all the time. And so he quasi kind of calms the kid down enough to where the kid lays down and he just talks to him about jobs he's had over the years just to change the subject and, and, and just calm this kid down. Meanwhile, Charlie said in the back of his mind, he was screaming out loud, what the fuck? You know, what the, what the hell is this? But he kept it cool, kept the shotgun real close, uh, laid right beside him on the cot. Uh, Grant, now remember, they're in a canvas tent. It is only so much canvas between them and the outdoors, and there's no real safety there. So, gets kid calmed down. They end up falling asleep. He said he, he's not sure exactly how much later it was, but it was on in the darkness. And, well, as dark as it gets that time of year. Let me preface that because it is land of the midnight sun. This was approximately uh, end of June. So the solstice had just passed. So there's roughly three to four hours of darkness at that time. Roughly. Uh, what would be considered darkness that time of year. It was basically twilight. So... It was at the darkest part, he said, that he could guesstimate because he ended up going outside. But what happened to draw him outside was a huffing sound. And he said it sounded like a bear huff. He's heard bear huffs before. And it didn't wake up the kid. He let the kid sleep. But he got up. He sat up. He put on his boots. He grabbed the shotgun. He grabbed the flashlight. And he went out this canvas tent. Now, he said when he went outside, he could still hear the huffing from the backside of the tent. So he was really on point. And he didn't want to, you know, obviously didn't want to shoot through the tent in any way uh, because the kid was sleeping. So he kind of backs away from the tent and kind of makes a wide half circle to give himself distance in case he had to shoot at something. When he comes around the backside... And he's beaming the flashlight. He said he saw a very dark object about 25 yards from the tent in the tall grass, uh, right near some uh, where some uh, willows were and, and whatnot. So he's looking and he's like, Hey, bear, 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 we're not food, bear. You gotta, you know, just doing bear deterrent type stuff. He said he started, he started beaming the flashlight at it. And this thing was, uh, he said, whatever it was, was kind of moving back and forth in the tall grass. He could just see darkness just above the grass line, right? And this, this thing was, you know, not all that far away, but just the lighting and everything. He, he wasn't getting a clear view, especially with the obstruction of the grass. So he said he took a, one more step, side step to his right. And he was just getting ready to shoot that little rubber bullet at this thing. And and it stood up. And when it stood up, uh, he said it kind of half stood up and then half hunched, then stood up all the way. He said, now this is a skilled carpenter who's 
constantly using measurements and he said it was over 10 foot tall and what freaked him out is when he was he kept the light on it the whole time as it stood up and what it was doing was turning its head to not uh give eye shine back right he said it took two steps to his towards his right not towards him but off to his right and then turned back and looked at him and he said when it turned it it, it turned its whole body and kind of just gave him a, a glancing kind of glare and then took off and he said it took off so fast without a sound just just out of there he said he freaked out uh he didn't know what the hell he was gonna i mean he felt like the shotgun wasn't enough instantly and so he retreats back into the tent uh he said he stayed up the rest of the night shaking and trying to calm himself down and like just explain away what just happened and what it could have been and anything but what he saw was what he was trying to convince himself of so he could calm down and it wasn't working at all um a couple hours after the sun came up which you know probably about 6 a.m 5 6 a.m that time of year uh he woke the kid up because the kid was sleeping really really hard he woke the kid up and said hey um we're not working today. We we need to make sure we're secure around this tent. <laughs> and the kid's confused. He's like, well, what happened? And he explains to him, well, that bear came by the tent last night. And I didn't want to wake you because nothing happened. And the kid immediately, eyes big as saucers, what? It was here. It was here. And, you know, the kid by this point wasn't buying the bear thing. They, they weren't outright saying it was a Sasquatch or anything like that, you know. Uh, they were kind of, it was unspoken. But they both realized it wasn't just something normal going on. What well, Charlie said that when he, he took the kid and they went over and he was kind of showing them, it, you know, you could see the grass laid down and stuff and then you could see the the direction in the grass with the grass bent over the direction this thing left and so him and the kid decided to follow that trail a little ways and and see if they could see some tracks right well they didn't they didn't find any and after about 50 yards of looking they they both wanted nothing to do with following this thing at all so they go back and charlie was trying to brainstorm what can we do to make this place more secure and so the best thing he could think of was to take a bunch of the uh, little smaller pieces of the tips and whatnot, a, a basically discarded uh, limbed and barked tree and kind of make a fence around at least the side of the, the tent that was on the back side away from the lake side. So they wanted to kind of like a, a half horseshoe kind of fence to keep a barrier between that thing and the actual tent it, what good that would do he didn't know but it was more peace of mind for himself and for the kid so they got it done relatively quickly uh <laughs> he said they were u- just using lag bolts and kind of making like crisscrosses and you know a little stand legs and stuff just to keep stuff up and from falling but just a barrier and so uh, it wasn't like a picket fence or anything. It was just, you know, a bunch of trees just kind of crisscrossed and, you know, into a quasi kind of boundary marker, basically. So he said they did nothing the rest of the day. They just kind of hunkered down in the tent. They would come out. Any noise, they would be outside the tent just looking around. Nothing. Just dead quiet. Didn't see a thing. Uh went to bed there was nothing that occurred during the night so they get up the next morning it was just nice and quiet and peaceful they heard the birds and everything was nice and calm they get back to work and they're working real fast um he made the made sure the kid knew how to shoot and uh basically showed him how to sling it the 12 gauge over his shoulder and still drag the logs to make it work and he didn't have pressure on the kid to like, hey, get that log over here like he normally would. Well, the kid did real well with it. 
Um, they they worked all day. They got a bunch accomplished. They were working real fast, and they had approximately two and a half days before this flight was to come back and pick them up for their week off. Again, it was one week on, one week off, uh, just because the remote conditions and stuff, the, the property owner had it set up that way, so there was no burnout. He wanted it done and done right, and someone not to be burnt out doing it. So, understandable. Well, the plane that would come and get them is this Turbo Otter. Very, very large bush plane that's capable of uh, quite a bit of... Uh, it could carry a, a quite a bit of weight, and uh, so anyway, they they're 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 working hard. Uh, day before the plane was supposed to come in, it starts raining, and since night he saw that thing leave after it stood up, hasn't been a peep out of this thing, no roars, no screams, no nothing. So they were nerves were calming down. So he's talking to the kid about the plane landing the next day, but it was raining. And he goes, sometimes, you know, with the weather, we can be socked in. We could, you know, we could have to wait for the weather to clear for the plane to land and stuff. So be aware of that and don't panic if the plane doesn't come tomorrow. Kid's like, no, no, I understand. Da, 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 da. And again, it had been quiet for a couple of days, so there was no immediate panic going on. Well... <clears throat> Uh, they get plenty of sleep that night. They're up early and it's really, really cloudy, but it's kind of broken cloudy. And so they hear the plane off in the distance. And so they're excited. So they already got their bags ready to go, uh, you know, for their week in town or whatever. And as they're talking about uh, what they're going to do with their week off and, you know, hey, you know, I don't want you partying or any of this, yada, yada. He's talking to his apprentice, just lining them out. Uh, they hear the plane getting closer and closer and the plane was able to land. Um, so when the plane landed, he, he, you know, he came on up to the dock. They tied off real quick. Uh, the guy had some uh, some materials that had to, you know, deal with the cabin build or whatever. It was you know, hardware and some lag bolts and some other stuff. So they, they're offloading stuff and they're putting it underneath this floor foundation that's up on pilings. So they get it all squared away. And as they're doing so, the weather just gets crummier and crummier, just deteriorates. And the pilot's like, hey guys, uh, we're not flying out today. This is too thick. I can't, they couldn't see to the end of the lake. Um, even though they all had a good idea, the pilot was like, I don't want to risk getting up because where the lake was, it wasn't that far off and they could potentially run into mountains and, and whatnot. So the pilot's like, I don't want to risk it. It's just too, the visibility is too shit. We'll, we'll take off first thing tomorrow. It should clear overnight. And they're like, okay, no big deal. And Charlie and the kid are calm because their ride out is right over there. It's just, it's a weather thing. So now they got an extra hand. And uh, this pilot was carrying a 44 Magnum on his hip for bears, you know, and whatnot. And so the pilot asked him, so how's it been? You know, just talking about the build. And out of the blue, the kid says, well, I think I saw a Bigfoot. And the, the pilot kind of chuckled. I was like, what do you mean you think you saw a Bigfoot? Well, they tell him everything that happened and whatnot. And the pilot looked really concerned and was like, looked at Charlie like, you're not pulling my leg, are you? And, and Charlie was like, look, man, the, the barrier out back from the tent that you saw, that you walked by a couple times, he goes, I put that up because of what I saw. I wanted some kind of barrier while we're sleeping, pre-warning system of this thing getting closer and the pilot looks really concerned and was like wow well hopefully it stays away and they all kind of laugh about it you know i thought nothing just kind of let it go so uh they all they went to sleep that night uh just before the sunrise it, it probably about 4 30 in the morning maybe roughly that time frame uh they were all woken up 
to a long, drawn-out howl that ended in a high-pitched scream that just echoed around everywhere. They couldn't pinpoint where it was coming from, but it sounded like it was over towards the backside of the lagoon into the trees, right? And where the, the trees end on the backside of that, it starts up a mountain. So, you know, they figured, okay, it's coming from over there, so it's at a distance. So they're all up. They're all getting dressed. They're all discussing what the hell, you know, and, and Charlie was telling them that's similar to the scream we heard, you know, a few days back or whatever. So pilot's like, well, we're going to, let's check the weather. We need to, we'll, we'll, we'll get out of here. So they all go outside. They're all looking around and it's still pretty damn socked in and it, actually a little worse than the day before when the pilot didn't want to fly. <laughs> so... As they're talking uh, and discussing things, the best route to go, uh, everyone's head's on a swivel. It's it's basically the clouds on the ground, so it, it's it's foggy, but daylight. It, it's kind of hard to explain. It's kind of like a, basically like fog, but it, until you've witnessed it yourself, it's kind of hard to put into words. So we'll just say it's similar to fog, right? Well, they're talking. They hear another short scream, but it was more, it was a lot closer, but it was a lot shorter, and it seemed a lot more um, aggressive sounding is, is the best Charlie could come up with. He said there was something to it that was just had a level of aggression to it. He wasn't sure why or how. Well, they... They decide they're going to load their stuff and be ready for takeoff. So if there's any any break whatsoever in the clouds or whatever, the pilot says we're going to jump in the plane and, and go for it. As they're waiting, they're, they're heating up coffee and whatnot. They're trying to cook some breakfast. All this stuff to take their minds off of the scream that woke them up and this aggressive sound sense. Well... They're constant. The pilot's looking at the back way towards this lagoon. Uh, Charlie's looking off to the back side of the tent. They're kind of not openly talking about it, but they're actively searching the perimeter. Well, the kid noticed, hey, there's some blue sky off in the distance, right? Pilot said, good enough for me. Now, Charlie said when he turned around to see where this blue sky was it was a tiny sliver off on the horizon right didn't matter pilot said good enough i can work with that. i could live with that that means it's uh, once we get up in the air i should be able to climb fast enough and know that it's it's broken clouds you know as i climb and i'll be able to be all right he goes i i know the area pretty well but we'll just we'll go for it so they all get in there he fires it up and uh he has to let it warm up a little bit whatnot and they pull away from the dock. Uh, Charlie pushes them off, gets up in the seat and everything. And the pilot just bangs it. Turbo Otter ain't no joke, man. Those things are powerful. So it immediately gets up on step and they, they take off. And they get up above the clouds relatively quickly. And as soon as they clear the clouds and it's, you know, it's open sky, it's daylight and whatnot. Uh... They get about 10 minutes into the flight and the pilot goes, I wonder if if I had enough altitude, I wonder if the clouds are clearing enough now to where we might be able to see the ground. I got enough fuel. Are you guys okay with me circling back and trying to see if, if the clouds broke to take a look? They're like, no problem. You know, we got, we're in a plane. So obviously we have a certain level of security. So the pilot does a couple passes, but it's just too too dark and stuff so they get out of there now charlie did not finish that project um when they got back uh him the apprentice and the pilot because charlie convinced the pilot hey we need to talk to the boss man and let him know what's going on um they let him know the the owner of the property was like, we've heard those screams before, but 
we just we just assumed it was some weird a bear does or something else does that we were just unaware of thought maybe it was wolves or something it, the owner was clueless about the wildlife he, he was very well-to-do man that used to a business environment not a wilderness environment so this place was his retreat and he wasn't necessarily an outdoorsman uh it was basically hey uh, i got the money i want a cabin right there that's a beautiful spot so that was the background on the on the boss but charlie never made it back um the property owner said he understood he was disappointed uh just because of charlie's skill set he wanted you know it done right and whatnot but charlie charlie wasn't going to have it um <laughs> i want to thank charlie uh he was hesitant because uh, he wasn't from alaska but his experience happened up here and when he contacted me he, you know he was a little upset he's like you probably don't want to use it because i'm not from alaska i said well no, i've shared plenty of people's experiences who weren't from alaska but if it happened here you know let's let's hear it um he he got bit by the bug so to speak he's jumping down every rabbit hole he can looking for answers just like a lot of us are you know especially who have had experiences out in the wild i want to thank charlie for sharing uh for reaching out uh, it, it's not easy a lot of times. I mean, poor Bill, you know, I interviewed him. He, he was nervous. He doesn't like the internet. He's not on Facebook, none of that crap. Uh, but he felt it was important to share. And uh, this is, that's the same thing Charlie said. So just be aware in remote Alaska. Again, the opening footage was up at the end of Buffalo Mine Road. Uh, I think... One of the places we stopped, they call that Grizzly Camp or something like that. Uh, anyway, thank you guys for joining me, and we'll catch you on the next one.